I got to say, I was really troubled. I mean, I'm, I'm following a Nobel laureate, so it's <laughs> a really, a really a hard act to follow, and it was a really, it was a really great speech. It was really, really, uh, really pertinent. Uh, I'm going to talk about something uh, somewhat different. Uh, I'm going to talk about economic growth, uh, which is a bit unusual of a topic for a civil engineer to talk about, but uh, economic growth is probably the most central thing in economic theory. Trying to understand how economies grow is, is really central, and, and most theories of economic growth focus on the production side of the economy, the, uh, the activities of firms, the use of technology to increase labor productivity. And, and this is totally pertinent. This is correct. I mean, that, that is the, the fundamental side of economic growth. But, but economies are circular. There's a yin and a yang to economic growth. For economic growth to occur, you also have to have consumption. You have to increase in the consumption side of the, the household activities. And uh, when you turn to, to cities, which is, which is my topic, that consumption side becomes really, really important. To understand how city economies grow, you need to know something about the, the change in the form of the city, the evolution in the, the, the infrastructure systems in particular, that's where the engineering in me comes in, and, and how the infrastructure impacts uh, urban, urban form, the design of, of, of buildings and houses, etc. And so, I'm, I'm, in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to try and explain to you how economic growth occurs through changes in, in urban form. Now, infrastructure has, has uh, featured in series of uh, economic growth going way, way back to the very beginning. Xenophon of Greece, for example, who wrote the book Oikonomics, okay, which really means um, um, estate management, really. But uh, he also wrote another book concerned with uh, how the revenues of Athens and how the revenues of Athens would, in, would in, uh, increase. Uh, one of the factors that he identified was loosely infrastructure safe and, and fine uh, harbor for ships, uh, retail space, buildings for seamen. You know, he also talked about things like mining silver, agriculture, uh, openness to trade, openness to foreigners, and, and avoidance of war. But infrastructure was part of this first theory of economic growth, if you like. Roll forward to, to the last century, there was a, a Canadian, uh, or at least a Canadian uh, professor at Canadian University, Norman Grass, who, uh, as an economic historian, identified it four phases that cities go through as they emerge to become financial centers. He starts with Antwerp, Belgium, where the first bourse developed. And really that was a city that developed warehousing techniques for, uh, uh, for trade. So it went beyond retail and started doing wholesale trade. And then the second phase that a city goes through is it becomes an industrial center. That can be because there's a concentration of people there and so it makes sense for the market is there. Someone like Jane Jacobs would add that, that uh, 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 cities create new industry because there's more innovation there. Many cities can go through those first two phases, become uh, trading centers and become uh, uh, industrial centers. But to reach the fourth phase of becoming a financial center, it becomes much, much more competitive. And that's because the third phase is the development of a city as a transportation hub. You know, all roads lead to Rome, all railway lines in England lead to London, all railway lines in France lead to Paris. Right? And it's that... <coughs> Development of a transportation hub that essentially, uh, by which a, a, a city essentially exerts power over its hinterlands. It begins to control the excess capital of its hinterlands and direct it towards where there's the greatest opportunity. And so in doing so, it is essentially become to emerge as a financial center. And so the financial center is that, is that fourth phase. You can see this, this key role of infrastructure in development of financial centers with a number of examples. I'll just give one here. This is the, uh, the Erie Canal, built in 1825. It was 363 miles long, joined New York to Buffalo on Lake Erie, 40 feet wide, uh, uh, 4 feet deep. It was considered a, a, fo a foolish project at first, but it made great returns. It essentially allowed uh, New York City to replace Philadelphia as the financial capital of the United States. There were other factors involved, too. But uh, this, this particular one was the one that, that, that third phase, it, it placed New York uh, basically at the head of a vast inland waterway connecting New York City to the Great Lakes region and the U.S. interior. There are, there are other examples in history too, the Gotthard Tunnel uh, through the Swiss Alps helped both Milan and Zurich r rise to become the financial centers of those two, of Italy and Switzerland, where previously uh, Turin or, or Geneva were actually larger financial centers. Uh, there's other examples, D Dubai Airport, Frankfurt Airport, even Toronto to some extent did better with airport investments than Montreal. But up to now I've only talked about uh, infrastructure in the development of financial centers. 
And I want to talk more broadly about how cities grow economically as a result of their infrastructure systems and their urban form. And so I really want to get more deeper into macroeconomic theory. So I'm going to go back and sort of restart again. Let's go to uh, 4th of July, 1776. Now, that's quite a notable date in history, the 4th of July, 1776. And uh, David Hume, well known as a philosopher today, but also a historian at the time, had a, a farewell dinner at his house in Edinburgh's New Town, which is shown on the slide. Now, Hume was actually a, a believer, a supporter of the, the US cause for independence, but his dinner that night actually had no bearing at all, on, 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 no relationship at all to US independence, because it would have taken six weeks for news of that, of that day to actually reach uh, London, let alone Edinburgh. He was actually holding a farewell dinner for his friends because he was dying. He knew he was dying, and he had decided he would have a, a dinner party. Uh, and so one of his friends that night was a, a younger man by 12 years called Adam Smith. And uh, Adam Smith is well known for his book, The Wealth of Nations. And, and given that he'd actually published it just four months earlier, and it probably took most of his, the, the people at the table about four months to read it, it, it might have been part of the dinner conversation. It's a little hard to imagine what you do talk about at a farewell party for someone who's dying, but anyway... What's interesting here is that Hume and Smith actually had very different philosophical views on, the, on what, was, what economic growth was all about. To Smith, it's all about division of labor, the free hand, invisible hand of the market, and investment in, inf investment in capital, you know, spend, spending money on tools that, that can make labor more productive. And that's the view of, of economic growth that has largely been developed and, and is sort of mainstream economic growth. Hume's view was, was very different. He, he studied the human psyche, and for him, it was all about love of gain. It was the ability to spend your money on luxury goods that actually drove people to actually bother to work. If they couldn't spend their money on luxury goods, they wouldn't bother working at all. So it was all about consumption that, that, uh, that, that Hume saw as being fundamental to economic growth. Now, uh, both are right. You know, the, both capture the two sides. But you have to critique Smith, even though Smith's, Smith's theory is really the sort of the mainstream theory. He gave, there's a very classic example in Wealth of Nation about pin makers. Now, the pins are not the most interesting product to talk about, but he gives an example where, uh, by use of, uh, of investment in capital, the work of 2,400 men in producing 48,000 pins per day could be replaced by a machine and 10 men. And that, for sure, would be an increase in labor productivity? Yes. But there's two questions you've got to ask. About, ask. First one is, who wants 48,000 pins a day anyway? <laughs> right? And also, what are the 2,390 unemployed pin makers going to do now? Right? You can only increase the income, the output of, the, of that society, of that neighborhood, of the economy, if the displaced labor finds work elsewhere, and that can only come about if there is an increase in consumption more generally throughout that economy. Now, the man who really understood this best was uh, Maynard Keynes, uh, probably the leading economist of the previous century. He recognized that, that consumption was the sole purpose of economic activity, the sole ultimate purpose at the end of it. And he, uh, he developed macroeconomic theory with, with the idea that a person's consumption is largely related to their income, tends to be proportional to their income, although there is something called autonomous consumption, which is consumption that occurs anyway because you, for, to, just to reach a necessary standard of living. And I think the evolution in what you would put in autonomous consumption can explain a lot about how economic growth occurs. Essentially, for economic growth to occur, with new, it, it is about new technology, but the new technology not only has to uh, increase the competitiveness of firms, so that they can increase labor productivity. The technology also has to become embodied uh, or, or built into people's everyday lives such that it becomes part of their autonomous consumption. And they, they really they can't do without it. Here's an example uh, that's close to some of you, but maybe some of the audience are a little bit too young to remember this. I'm going to take you back to 1994. This is the Popular Mechanics magazine, 1994, Understanding the Information Superhighway. Now, 1994 was the year that Mosaic Browser was developed. So the web, World Wide Web was only just coming together. And people didn't really know what it was going to lead us to. We had some ideas. If you look a little bit closer to this caption, you can see there, underneath the main title, it says, how you'll shop, bank, learn, and be entertained by, and more, by interactive TV. Yeah. <laughs> they were, they were it was close. It was correct. 
what happened was you had, people were already using personal computers. I was a graduate student. I had a PC I used to do boring work on. And there was also, the internet was already there. That had been in invented for military purposes. And then these two technologies came together, essentially, or, and the World Wide Web was born. Uh, three years later, the dot-com bubble started. That lasted until about year 2000 and collapsed. But after that, all these new companies came about. And uh, businesses understood that they could actually lay off labor and use the web to increase their, their sales and their productivity. Banks laid off staff, for example. But at the same time, the PC, the personal computer, had become a, an indispensable item of household consumption. Everyone had to have one. It was now ingrained in our personal consumption. Now, so there's an example of how the personal computer has, has been behind uh, economic growth. But look at the other subtitle in that, uh, in that slide there. It says, the greatest social revolution since the automobile. If there's one technology that has defined growth of our cities, it's obviously the car. Henry Ford, for example, noted that, that although the, the car was a luxury at first, it evolved to become an indispensable item of household, uh, household use. As we, in the last century, as decade by decade, we build our cities to be more and more automobile dependent, we created jobs for many people. There's also the, the auto manufacturing people, but there's gas, gas station attendants, there's uh, car insurance people, there's our beloved parking attendants, all the jobs and employment based around our, our, the lock-in of the automobile to our cities. And it wasn't just in the, in the transportation sector that new jobs were created. The automobile allowed our, our cities to spread out, and the, the area per person for, for, for buildings grew. This low sprawl developed. And in the United States, for example, from 1950 to year 2000, the, uh, the average size of the house doubled. And because of changing demographics and changing family size, the, actually, so the space per person tripled. That meant three times more paint, three times more furniture, three times more carpets, three times more paving stones, larger closets for three times more shoes, of course, and clothes, right? And so the, this evolution in urban form allowed greater consumption. Now, this is not a good thing environmentally, right? And I spend most of my time actually preaching against urban sprawl. But it's important to recognize that urban sprawl is a, f is a physical manifestation of economic growth. Economic growth isn't just some numbers that appear on the television set at the end of the news, right? It actually has a physical, it's a physical thing to it. It actually looks like this. This is 20th century economic growth. The problem is, though, that our cities develop this very consumptive form and it's too consumptive. We have to go back to Smith and Hume. There's this balance between consumption and saving. If we built very, very highly consumptive cities where everyone's locked into lifestyles and unable to spend all, it means that people have to spend all their money on transportation, then our savings rates go down. And sure enough, when you look at the end of last century, uh, in particular uh, in North America, but also it, it's, it holds for North Australia too, the countries with the most sprawled cities, Savings rates went down to essentially zero, just around about 2008, which is an interesting year because there was a major financial crisis that year, right? And it was part of it. Whereas a European country like France, they managed to maintain their savings rates a little bit higher. Now, there can be other things behind savings rates too. Availability of credit could be different. But just to sort of reinforce this idea a little bit more, there was a study uh, by Statistics Canada in 2005 which said Canadian households are over-consuming on transportation. So we can see that there is a link between the shape of cities, the urban form of cities, and that macroeconomic balance between investment, which comes from saving, and consumption. Right. I'm going to end with, with one more example. Uh, and I, as you realize, I like to jump around in history. So let's back up a little bit further, and let's go to the 2nd of September, 1666. It had been a, a, a particularly dry summer in London, and there was a strong easterly wind blowing across the city of London. Uh, early in the morning, uh, a fire breaks out at Thomas Farriner's house in Pudding Lane. By 3 o'clock in the morning, one of Samuel Pepys' servants can spot the, the fire from a quarter of a mile away. And by the uh, early morning, the fire had spread about half a mile down the Thames, burning down the only water engine that they had unfortunately. Uh, the Londoners were a bit slow to react on the Sunday morning. They tried to make fire breaks, but the, the, the flames jumped over the larger streets. 
Three days later, when the wind finally dropped, 85% of the city of London within the walls had been burnt to a cinder. If this wasn't bad enough, the English were at war with the superior Dutch, who were allied with the French, of, of course, and the previous year, 69,000 Londoners had died of the plague. These are really, really terrible times. You would think, will you just give up on the city and walk away? It's burnt down. But within five years, London had been rebuilt. It was more magnificent than ever before, and it was the grandest, richest city in Europe. Uh, it did take a little bit longer for Christopher Wren to rebuild the churches and the, and the religious buildings, but pretty much most of the city of London had been rebuilt. And the reason why there was such a great economic boom from this rebuilding was because they developed new building codes. Wren and Hook and four others were developed to, to, build, to construct new building codes. And the new code said that all buildings had to be uh, fronted in brick and stone. There had to be proper downspouts. And the streets had to be widened somewhat. And there was a, a form that put commercial space below residential space, which is the perfect mixed land use that we all aspire to today. And through this new urban form, uh, new industries developed. There was a new industry for downspouts. There was expansion of the industries for materials, for bricks, for stone, etc. And so uh, it was a change in the, the urban form of the city, the building codes, the shape of the city that actually led to this great economic boom. And similar examples can be given in, in, London, in the, uh, London in the 19th century and into New York in, in the 1930s. Uh, but I'm going I'm to end it there. Uh, I'm just going to summarize in, with a few words, since I've been using visuals throughout. Uh, the key insight that I've shown today really came, comes from Keynes. Keynes said, a man's habitual standard of life usually has the first claim on his income. Keynes recognized that there, both the, there's a consumption and a production side to the economy, and both have to move together in order for economic growth to occur. And what I'm really adding is that, that uh, the habitual side, our habits, are, are shaped by the environment around us, by the shape of our cities. Our consumption is governed by the size and shape of the physical space that we inhabit and the paths and distances that we travel to satisfy human wants and needs. Thank you.